I'm Anthony Minotti, Assistant Superintendent for Student Support Services, and I'm joined by Lori Freeman, our Director of Special Education. This is our second part of a three-part video on the maze of special education and guiding parents through that special education maze. In our first video, we spoke about a number of topics from RTI to CSE to CPSE, um, and we spoke a little bit about the referral process, but we're going to get into more depth on this, uh, on this video about the uh, evaluation process. Remember, the evaluation process begins in general education, where the teacher is keeping data and ob observational data on your child, whether they're having different types of learning challenges. For example, if they're, if they're on a uh, guided reading and we are assessing them through a program called Fontes and Pinnell, if they have to be on certain levels to be on benchmark for grade level, if they're significant below that benchmark, there might be, a, there is a concern. And they may be receiving other types of services called Academic Intervention Support Services, better known as AIS. However, if, if the challenges of learning continue or the challenges of social development continue, there is a process through what is called the instructional support team. During this process, response to intervention, instructional support team, um, you have the right, the legal right, remember, to request an evaluation uh, of your child at any time as it relates to a referral to special education. So you put that in writing uh, to the district, uh, to the principal, to me, to the psychologist, to Ms. Freeman, um, and we'll honor that request. But we encourage you to work through the IST RTI process so that we can get a better, a more comprehensive evaluation of your child. So the referral we, we reviewed during our first video, and once again, it's all outlined in this parent guide to special education, which has been written by the school district. Now, we talked about the evaluation process. Can we talk a little bit about the specificities, Lori, of the evaluation? What types of tests are given by certain individuals, staff members? Sure. Um, the evaluations are begin with a psychological. The psychologist will give a psychological and it depends on the, there's different tests that we can give. We can give the uh, Woodcock-Johnson, we can give the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. Um, we can even give a nonverbal test for students who may not have enough language to show us their um, intellectual levels. So um, that's one and those Major are usually component. done by the psychologist, yes. social work, a psychologist, special ed teacher? The, those are just the psychological. That would be done by only by the psychologist. Okay. They are trained and recently, um, they were recently trained in some of the testing. As, we, as a new test is developed in terms of updating, we make sure that the psychologists are trained in that and we recently did that this past year. Great. The um, educational testing, yes. that's done by a special education teacher in the building. And those, again, are similar names, the Woodcock-Johnson, um, there's the, uh, the uh, WIST, which is the uh, Wexler scale for, for um, educational testing. And it does, it, it, it goes into reading, math, writing, um, oral reading fluencies, different fluencies when we're looking to see in terms of processing, how can, can students do something in a given time? Uh -huh. um, and we, so we, we do a thorough educational, and that's again done by the special education teacher. If it's recommended, do we do any speech and language? Yes. One, before we get to the related service type of evaluations, uh -huh. part of the process is a classroom observation. The psychologist generally is the person who will go into a classroom and write up an, a, an observation. It doesn't have to be the psychologist. Sometimes it's a, an intern who will do that. But someone of the members of the team will go into the classroom. We also do a social history. And our, that's where our social workers come, come in. And they will meet with parents to review and a social history. 
a physical exam is required um, as part of the CSE. You want to make sure that there isn't a reason. One time I had a situation where that wasn't given in a timely way and we found out that the student needed glasses. It changed the whole evaluation process. When you're reading, you need your glasses. Right. So um, those are the standard and then as you asked me about sometimes speech and language. If we suspect um, maybe there's a language concern, uh, we will definitely um, do a speech and language. Sometimes, not often, we will do an occupational therapy evaluation, a physical therapy evaluation. It depends, and we depend on the referral process to let us know where the areas that a suspected need are. But at a meeting, if we determine there's more information needed, we could always at that CSE, Committee on Special Education, we could always, as a team, recommend those further evaluations. Absolutely. Sometimes, at a, and, it, and the meeting is called an individual, uh, uh, an initial eligibility determination meeting, there are times where we can't make that determination at that meeting. That's okay, because we will then ask for the additional evaluations and come back to committee before to make that determination. Now, do parents have a right to uh, request a, or do they have a right, first of all, to go for a private evaluation on the outside and have the school district review that private evaluation? Absolutely, they do. However, the school district does reserve the right to do testing, and all, testing can only be done with consent. But if a parent would like to, to give us uh, outside information, we're happy to have that. But they do have to understand that we will do our own testing when we feel it's appropriate. And if a parent does not agree with our testing, do they have a right to request an outside independent evaluation? Yes, they do. But they, it has to be for only evaluations that we have performed. They can't, let's say they, we didn't do a speech and language and they say, no, I'm going to go, I want you to give me, give my child an independent evaluation in that area. If we haven't done the testing, then no. So we would say to them, let's do our evaluation. We come to committee again, we make a determination, and then they can ask for that. Good. What other kinds of assessments once the child, so through this evaluation process, let's, let's say that the child is identified mm -hmm. as having a disability and is under the IDEA regulations qualified for special education. What other types of evaluations do you think would be required? In addition to what we've done? Yes. Um, besides the ones that I've named? Um, a high school student? High school, yes. Um, for a high school student, a student who, um, actually not a high school student, we start back at a sixth grade. Yeah. Students in sixth grade, we, have to, we give a vocational one assessment, three parts to that. One part is the student, one part is a parent, and one part is the teacher. And that's really gearing towards what is that student going to do post high school. And sometimes parents or students in sixth grade say, what is this? Why is that? It's very important that we start as young as possible to start thinking about what is our plan for when the student leaves the Maranek High School. Some students will go on to college. Some school may go on, may, students may go on to a vocational uh, site. Some students may go on to work. It's all dependent. But without that conversation and that piece of what areas, we can't really gear their middle school and high school careers towards helping them get to what their plans are after they leave Mamaroneck. So. And most of our evaluations or initial evaluations are at the elementary level. Is that correct? Absolutely. But a child may go through elementary school and be referred for special education at the middle school mm -hmm. and at the high school. Absolutely. So Even at any time in their school career, a parent or a team, a staff, mm -hmm. can request that that child be evaluated. Absolutely, yes. Good. Good. And so in terms of when we talk about and we're at the CSE meeting, uh, we talked about how the child becomes classified. Now we talk about also least restrictive environment at the at the CSE meeting, LRE. And we're going to come back to that more uh, when we talk further, but can you explain a little bit about uh, what we call LRE, Least Restrictive Environment? So and once again, it's explained in the handbook. Absolutely. 
the least restrictive environment is we want our students for the most of the day that they can possibly be in a general ed setting. For some of our students, that's all day, the whole time that they're in school. For some of our students, they, maybe they're in a special class, but for lunch and recess and maybe specials, they can be out with their general ed uh, peers. And for some students, that may not happen for much of the day, but least restrictive and in terms of the programs, we want our students to be in general education classes as much as possible. And I believe the law reads to the maximum extent possible. Absolutely. And so uh, the, uh, our, our philosophy, at least in Mimarinek, is to take the program to the child, not bringing the child to the program. So we, we encourage a lot of push-in services uh, for our children to receive those types of support. There are times where the child needs more tranquility, privacy, small group, individualized, where we have to pull the child out for a certain amount of time. Very similar to what general ed students do when they go out for reading right. and, exactly. and other types mm -hmm. of supports. Right, exactly. Now, um, the, when we talk about, we're gonna talk about a continuum of services also. You're gonna hear the term continuum of services at the Committee on Special Education meeting. Can we briefly describe, because once again, it is described in the handbook thoroughly, but if you could give just a general overview of continuum of services. Right, the services are, start with just a related services only. Maybe the student needs speech and language. They could have a speech and language only, and so they go out of their general ed class for that period of time that they need, and it might be OT or uh, physical therapy. Um, the next, in terms of programs, the student needs has academic needs more so than just the speech and language or the motor needs. If the student needs a program, that would be start least restrictive would be a consultant teacher service model. And that's where a special education teacher would push in, as you just said, to the general ed classroom for a period of time uh, within a six day cycle. So maybe uh, the, the, the regulations say they need to have two hours weekly. So we might give that service 30 minutes, um, I would have to go through again and figure out 30 minutes four times a week. Um, if it's in a six day cycle, we would figure out the, the time for that. And there's also consultant teacher direct, which is directly to the student, and there's consultant teacher indirect, which is to the classroom teachers, to the staff who would be working with the teachers, where the special education teacher meets with the general ed teacher to talk about what the student is doing and make um, um, suggestions. Now, as we go through the continuum of services, the child might need more service, additional service time. What is the next level? That would be a resource room. Resource room is skills development. Areas of need, let's say there's an area of reading only. So maybe that would be, again, it goes back to the goals. Everything is driven starting with the goals. So the student would have goals in the reading area. That would be addressed in resource room. Resource room is a small group, five, uh, up to five students in, in, in that session with like like area of need. So, so let me emphasize though uh, for our parents, we are addressing the IEP goals that have been written already right. in the IEP. And something to keep in mind, because it comes up often, you had talked before about the Fontes and Pinnell levels. Special education is not there to, to, to deal with the level of the um, general ed. We are skills deficits. So the child has to be, have a significant need below grade level, not just a year below, but significant. And I'm often asked that. Well, I don't understand, well, why doesn't my child qualify? Because that's general ed, and that's, that's what we talked about with the RTI and the AIS services. That's not special education. That is building level services. But in resource room, they could get some reading support in mm -hmm. resource room, we're focusing on goals. They could get support in study skills, organization skills. Uh, that is often um, what's, what special education teachers do in resource room is organizational skills, organization systems. Um, there may be academic goals in, in reading or math or both. Uh, but 
to a level where they can be maintained in a general ed class and this is just the area of need so that we can build up those skills. And the student usually goes to the resource that, room. That is a pull-out program um, depending, again, it's 180 minutes a week so we figure that out in our six-day cycle how to accomplish that. Um, it might be combined with a consultant teacher service where um, it could, the three hours could be some of the time it could be the special education teacher conferring with the general education teacher and that's the indirect consultant teacher service and then the resource room may be two hours of direct service to the student in a pull-out section so they do miss time in the general ed setting. Okay, so our next uh, uh, level of support would be the integrated co-teaching, and I'm going to abbreviate it to be ICT, that's what we call it, and that is a general education teacher and a special education teacher in the classroom for a period of time. It looks a little different in each of the settings. So in elementary school, it's for four and a half hours of the time that the student, the academic area time. In the middle school, it's a period. Maybe it's period for English, period for math. In the high school, it could be a period for English, it could be math, it could be social studies, it could be science. And that's the time that those two teachers are in the classroom um, supporting. supporting the students. And um, we are, uh, the board has a goal this year, a mm -hmm. priority goal, uh, to review uh, the uh, different components of integrated co-teaching. And just for our parents, we have a number of consultants in district working with our staff mm -hmm. uh, to provide the skill set uh, to provide your children with the kinds of services they need in integrated co-teaching classes. And now we and go to the next level of services in the continuum called? Special class. It used to be called self-contained, but it's no longer. It's a special class and it's determined by the ratio. So the, we have special class 12, 1, Two. What does that mean? 12 students, up to 12 students, one teacher, and two support staff. That could be aides, that could be TA. In most cases, the two in the elementary school are teaching assistant and an aide in that classroom. And then we also have more restrictive special classes where it's an 812. And again, it's eight, up to eight students, one teacher, and two support staff members. Good. And if we are not able to provide services and programs within our district, appropriate services and programs within our district, what is the next step in the continuum of services? Okay, depending on the needs, we will have to look for an out-of-district placement that is generally a day placement, and sometimes it could be a BOCES placement, or there are private schools that are state-approved. Again, we're only allowed to put on an IEP anything that's state approved. And that's a process that we go through and parents get to visit whatever program it would be before we accept it at committee. And um, it's sometimes needed. If a child is hospitalized, mm -hmm. do we provide educational service during hospitalization? Absolutely, it is our requirement. If it's a student who has been in general education, they'll still get their academics. If a student's been identified with some of the special education services, they will get special education services as well. And um, I just want to go back to the term that we spoke about in our first video called free. Is there any charges to the parents if their child is placed in an out-of-district program? No, that's... Or if they're getting tutoring in the hospital? No, that is a school district's responsibility. Free, appropriate public education, FAPE. Good. And what about uh, home instruction? We have some students mm -hmm. at times that cannot attend school for a, a temporary period of time. Is the district responsible for providing home instruction? Yes, the district is responsible. What we put on the IEP, it will say special class one-to-one, -one, and that's how we um, account for it. So it is part of an IEP. So we've talked about the continuum of services. Mm -hmm. Wonder if the child needs more support to surround those continuum of services. We talked a little bit about the speech therapist. Mm -hmm. What are those kinds of supports do we, we filter into those programs so that those, child's, those children also meet success with added related services? What are our related services? Mm -hmm. 
that we offer. We offer, obviously, we offer speech and language, occupational therapy. We um, offer physical therapy. Um, sometimes it's orientation and mobility for a student who might need that. Um, services that we would contract from BOCES might be vi for vision, uh, for hearing. It's it's quite extensive. Counseling services would be a part counseling of them. Social worker, psychologist. Yes, counseling. School related. School school related. School based counseling. Um, we happen to have a very strong strong DBT program um, that our psychologists have been involved in, and again, you'll hear about that at the next board meeting because we'll be talking about um, special education services um, then. Okay, and as part of other services that the uh, Board of Education provides for free is that we also have a consulting school psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, so there are times where our psychiatrist needs to be involved. We also have a physician who's also connected with our school district so that if there needs to be a, 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 a medical uh, mm -hmm. diagnosis and or a medical opinion, uh, our, our consulting physician for the Board of Ed is also involved. So this series, this, this, this last video now has focused on the continuum of services. We talked about, once again, specifically what goes on through the evaluation process. And we talked about uh, a transition plan. And we talked about related services and the continuum of services. Once again, please follow along in the booklet um, in terms of a parent's guide to special education. And please remember, if you do have other questions, visit our website, Student Support Services, or visit the SEPTA website, the Special Education PTA website. And also there's a number of series of support groups that are available through SEPTA. Um, so thank you very much for watching and tune into our next part three.